Um, for those of you who wondered whether the new edition of the Geology of Scotland would ever appear, because we've talked about it for a long time, um, I give you the evidence. Tonight's speaker, Rory, uh, has been able to give us a DOI code for his chapter. So it's real. It does exist. It is coming. It's on its way. Uh, my chapter has gone to uh, the copy editors today. So it's happening, folks. It's it's going to be, it in, well, maybe not in your Christmas stockings, but it uh, is on its way. Anyway, it's my very great pleasure to introduce to you tonight uh, Professor Rory Mortimer. Um, now, he's gone up there, his um, sidekick, can I call you that? Uh, his uh, um, lecture buddy, I suppose. Um, Danny Long is going to uh, assist perhaps later on in some of the questions. I think because Rory was a little bit worried that some of his past colleagues and, and so on would be in the audience and might make life a little bit difficult for him. Uh, so there they all are. We know who we know where you are. Anyway, um, Mike and I have had a, a, a very pleasant hour or so chatting away with Rory and Danny about uh, something I know very little about, uh, really very little at all, the Cretaceous uh, in general, but certainly the Cretaceous in Scotland. Uh, Danny is here as the chapter leader for the, the uh, new uh, chapter in the, the fifth edition. Uh, and so um, I think in this uh, case, particularly, uh, Rory and Danny rather struggled with the word limit that they were presented with, first of all, because there really is rather a lot to say about the Cretaceous of Scotland. It's not a few scraps of onshore exposure. There's clearly a wealth uh, that Rory and his colleagues have spent many, many years researching into. So it's been a great challenge to condense that information into um, more pages than you were originally allowed, I think, is, is the case. I think 11 pages was the original, and it's about 20 now. Well done, that man. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I look forward, uh, Danny, to hearing what, uh, uh, Rory, to what you and Danny have got to tell us tonight about the Cretaceous, uh, Atlantic rifting, inversion tectonics, and marine transgression in our Hebrides and offshore basins. There was clearly quite a lot going on. Thank you very Rory. much. Um, and, and thank you very much for the invitation to come up here and give this talk. Okay. Uh, Danny Long and I have worked together on, on, on the Cretaceous for 20 odd years. Um, and Danny loves the chalk and the Cretaceous just like I do. So he was a great guy to, to get to join in. And of course he's worked much more than I have on the offshore basins with Shell and others. And so combining our two, two bits of lack of knowledge of Scotland and the geology of the Cretaceous, I think we've come up with a, a chapter with quite a lot of new things in it. Um, first of all, as you are all here in Scotland, and I've just asked one or two of you if you recognize that view, do you know where it is? I mean, you're Scottish geologists. First thing is to know where you are. Yeah, um, that's Aaron. It's actually looking, Goat Fell is up on the, up on the right of your picture, um, up there. And, that, and that's, if this works, yeah, just about. And this valley is the string going across the middle of Arran. Um, and actually we're taking, the photograph's taken from one of the blocks of Cretaceous rocks sitting in the collapsed caldera in the middle of Arran. We'll come back to all of that later. One of the interesting, one, I suppose one of the things we found when we started to, to work on this uh, was that the offshore Cretaceous is actually the most widely developed system, proven offshore of all the geological systems. So there's a huge amount of information. And we have to then condense all of that into the shortest chapter in the book, pretty much, um, as well as the onshore stuff. Uh, and I, was, I will make the point here and, and again later on and congratulate BGS on their offshore memoirs. I don't know how many of you have read them and used them, but it's, it's full of incredibly valuable information. And the, it's not only BGS, of course, it's the Pharaoh's Geological Survey as well. And the places like the, um, uh, the, the, the Pharaoh's and Shetland Basin, the new information that's come out of there has really helped us link the offshore basins both on the east and west coast of Scotland, 
and the onshore in the Hebrides successions. And that's what we're going to try and pull together tonight and try and prove to you that it works. Because a lot of people will probably think it doesn't work. So I'm going to just identify what's new and what's, uh, what's different. In the previous editions of this book, uh, that's the fourth edition, Stuart is here, Stuart Hutt, there you go, Stuart Hutt, the, the, the author of the previous edition, he's produced some wonderful paleogeographical maps in that edition. And there's no way that we were going to redo all of those and put them in our chapter. We simply didn't have room to do it anyway, even to summarise one. So I, I'm very keen that people cross-refer back to the work that's already been done. There's no point in repeating that. What we have done, though, is put in a completely new and revised Inner Hebrides succession, recognizing different rocks that have never, never before been properly described or recognized. We've linked that succession to Northern Ireland, which is very similar and surprisingly never linked properly together before either. And we've updated the information from the offshore basins taken from all the massive amount of work and exploration, it's beautifully synthesized by BGS in their offshore memoirs. And those of you who want to know more about what we're talking about tonight, please look at those BGS offshore memoirs. The details are there and the references to the publications. We've also produced a new link, taking the offshore onshore geology and, and using things like tectonics, sea levels and conformities to show that they're the same onshore as offshore. And they're the same in the Western basins offshore Scotland, as in the North Sea to the east. We've also tried to make it a much wider picture, a wider continent ocean link with common events, particularly in the late Cretaceous, where we have the sub Hercynian tectonism and interregional unconformities. So all of that is pretty new. Now, I know you all know your Cretaceous well, but I thought I ought to. Uh, I ought to just start by giving you a background to the Cretaceous. Uh, these are the, these are the st stage names which have been ratified by the International Subcommission on Cretaceous Stratigraphy. And the, I, I do want you to at least remember some of these, Cenomanian, Chironian, Coniacian, Santonian, Campanian. You're going to remember those, aren't you, by the end of this talk? You certainly will. Um, this particular group of stages in the Cretaceous used to be called the Sononian. And in all the old literature, including in the fourth edition of the, of the Geology of Scotland book, the Sononian is widely used. And yet the Sononian was agreed and taken out in 1984 as part of Cretaceous stratigraphy, which is a long time ago and long before any of these publications. So we're still using outdated uh, terminology in a lot of the literature in the, in the Cretaceous. There's been a big debate down here if some of you prefer, I know, Ryazanian to Beriasian, and that's because there's a big debate and still going on. Should we be using terminology which relates to what was the ancient Tessis, the ancient ocean that's obviously gone, gone now and, uh, and into the Alps, um, but that was around the tropics, or do we use the Beriasian, which has faunas, which are, or the other way around, which has faunas related to the Tessian, and the Ryazanian, which has faunas related to the boreal northern seas. That's always a problem, and the Lower Cretaceous has always been a problem inter internationally in recognizing how things correlate, because a lot of the faunas are endemic. So what I'm just going to quickly run through now is show you on this, on this if it comes up, um, are the main unconformities that are mapped offshore on seismic sections. So you have the base Cretaceous unconformity, the BCU at the base here. Then you have what we call the Plenus Miles, which is here, which is the Cenomanian Turonian boundary, always, always known as the CT boundary, and it has what's known as an oceanic anoxic event. And those of you who don't know anything about that, I'm not going to try and explain it all now, uh, but that's for later. Um, and then we have what's called the MCU. Now, this has been introduced recently in, in the BGS offshore memoirs uh, for the um, uh, for the Faroe Shetland Basin. And I think it's a brilliant idea, and I'll show you, hopefully show you why in a, in a few slides time. But the MCU is the mid-Cretaceous unconformity. It is going to cause total chaos 
in the Cretaceous because we used to have a mid Cretaceous, which was quite different. The Aptian Albion here and the, the mid Cretaceous boundary with the upper Cretaceous used to be the Albion Cenomanian boundary. Nevertheless, it's in the BGS memoirs. It's widely published by Stoker it's, and others. And it's a very useful concept and it's one I want to build on. Um, and then we have what's called the early Campanian unconformity. And these are very widespread unconformities that are, you can see on seismic sections. And then of course you have the base tertiary unconformity, which is pretty clear everywhere. So those are the, the stages. You see the ages of the rock we're dealing with. You can see the main unconformities there. And we're gonna go and expand on that a bit. But before I do, I'd just like to give you an idea what makes the Cretaceous a little different. These are curves for global sea level and global sea level change. So if you look at this, you can see here, high in the Cretaceous, we've got some of the highest sea levels recorded in the Phanerozoic. And those sea levels are 200 plus meters above present day. If you melted all the ice in the world today, how much would you raise sea levels by? 70, 75 meters. Yes, you've been reading the, geos, the, geo, <laughs> the American Joel's up. Yeah, about that. And if you did that and you the oceans heated up, obviously you'd expand the oceans by a bit more. By what? Another five, 10 meters. So you're talking perhaps 80 meters if all of those things happened. So how did sea levels get 200 meters above present? What was driving that? You, didn't, you thought you were coming to a lecture tonight. Roger can answer that, Roger. Um, sorry? Ocean spreading. Ocean spreading, yep. That's why. Yep. Okay, Let's, you, you've hit the nail on the head there as one key point. I'm going to just show you one other sea level curve before we go there, because this is a global one for the, for the Phanerozoic. But if we show one just for the uh, mostly middle and late Cretaceous, this is Hancock's 2000 curve, which is very, very useful one. You can see that the sea level is progressively rising from down here from the Albion and progressively rising all the way up into the Maastrichtian with two peaks, one up here in the Campanian and one up here in the Maastrichtian. And these chalks or these, these rocks are, have belemnites in them. And I say that now because the belemnites have been found in the chalks of Scotland, but only on the highest hills in places like Ben Eden and other places. We'll come back to that, but I'm just pointing out where the peaks are because they're very important to understanding the transgression of the chalk seas onto Scotland and elsewhere. So why were sea levels quite so high? Well, one explanation is, if you look at this again, you've got your Cretaceous stage names here going up into the up, up into the Paleogene. And on this, you'll see where the upper Cretaceous is here. And if you look at crustal production, this is in cubic kilometers per year along the mid-ocean ridges, you'll see that the, the big increase during the Cretaceous, during the mid and upper Cretaceous at this point. And it's been suggested that there was a huge hotspot, particularly under the Southeast Pacific. And with increased, with increased production of, of ocean crust, you're actually pushing ocean water out of your ocean basins onto the continents. So that's one idea. It's the main idea that's been given for having sea levels quite so high during the Cretaceous. But you'll see it doesn't really match up necessarily completely with the sea level curve. Now, why might sea levels stay higher after that rate of expansion on the mid-ocean ridges has ceased? What might still be happening to those rocks to create keep sea levels high? And this is an, only an idea that I've had over the years, trying to put it together, never proved. But what, what, what is actually changing in your ophiolites? Your, 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 what, what happens when they metamorphose? What happens to, 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 to um, olivine? Expansion of the minerals through water circulation and heat. That metamorphism going on on the mid-ocean ridge materials I suspect that that's turning everything to, to, to serpentinite and increasing your volume has kept sea levels higher than they would normally have been, uh, I suspect. And one of you can prove it. I have no idea. I'm throwing it out to you as an idea 
of why sea level stayed so high. And you, by the end of the talk, you can have a go at me and tell me I'm completely wrong. And there's other much, much more sensible explanations for it. But I've thrown that diagram in. It's a lovely diagram. It comes from um, the Open University bo book on the Cretaceous by Peter Skelton and his Open University team pulling together this sort of data. It's a lovely diagram uh, uh, allowing us to get a picture of what's going on globally. So globally in the Cretaceous, the late Cretaceous, high sea levels and very different rates of expansion of, of, the, uh, of the crust at the mid-ocean ridges. So the Inner Hebrides. In the Inner Hebrides, we have these little points in green. Can you see those points in green on this map? Just about pick them out. They, these are the little points. These are the sections uh, where the Inner Hebrides Cretaceous, Upper Cretaceous is present. We only have one little spot of, of um, Lower Cretaceous. Uh, that's up here somewhere, Danny, isn't it? Right. That you, you went and tried to find it, didn't you? And, and, and yeah. The quaternary's, quaternary's got in the way, hasn't it? Yes. Sorry? You, tr you tried to excavate it out. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, it, there's not much there. So it's primarily upper Cretaceous in these little spots, in these islands, in the Inner Hebrides. And they are actually incredibly valuable. And I point out Northern Ireland as well, because the Cretaceous in Northern Ireland has great similar similarities to that in the Inner Hebrides and really ought to have been compared much, much sooner. Uh, and uh, and we, would have, we wouldn't have had the problems we have now. Can these Inner Hebrides remnants be linked to offshore basins? That's a big question. And to wider Cretaceous events? Well, we put together this map and of course you can see all the detail on this map, can't you, Roger? Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, it might seem a complicated map, but I tried to put all the different basins from the different me offshore memoirs together. But the information in each memoir is different in terms of level of information available for each basin. So what I had to do in the end for the Rockall Basin was to have, have this, uh, an indication of this distribution of the Cretaceous. In the North Sea Basin, it's easier. We've got to know a lot more about it, but I point out this purple bit, which is the deep graben areas going up into the Viking Grab and then coming up here into the Moray Firth. And then you've got up here, you've got the Faroes, Faroe Islands up here and the Shetland Islands here. So you've got the Faroes Shetland Basin here. And then you've got the Hebrides and West of Hebrides basins offshore here. And we'll be mentioning all of those as we go through. Uh, there are a lot of other things on this map uh, which will be relevant and are discussed in the chapter, which including these transfer zones, uh, it, all in this particular direction. They're actually lineaments which are very important to the story of Scotland, and I'm sure you know all about them, can discuss them elsewhere. Um, and no doubt you will tell me that this map doesn't make any sense at all, and, but I, hopefully you'll see what we've tried to do. We've put the Faroe Shetland Basin with its particular key up here, the North Sea Basin with its key here, the Rockall Basin with its key here. But you see the amount of Cretaceous around Scotland, all these basins. And we've summarized that into one page, have we, Danny? <laughs> we've had very limited space to be able to put this together. Hence this slightly complex diagram because we had not no space for a lot of diagrams. So this is, this is put together as best I can. Now these charts, people will die when they see these charts and say, oh my God, look at that detail on that thing. What are we gonna do with this? But they're actually relatively straightforward and they're very useful. All the vertical lines here tell you where there's no rock. All the blocks tell you where the rock is. Here you've got your Cretaceous stages again, which we started with. You know them by heart now, and you're coming up here in the Cenomanian, Tyronean, Coniace, and so on. And, and these, this is the west of Hebrides Basin, this is west of Shetland, and this is northern North Sea. So you'll see the distribution. For example, if we go down to the what we call the lower Cretaceous here, look how much lower Cretaceous is present in the west of Hebrides, virtually nothing. And then we come into the west of Shetland, there's much more, and of course in the North Sea a bit more. But there are still these hiatuses with these lines are showing, where the breaks are, where there's no, no rock. 
So although this chart might look horrible to start with, and you think, oh God, we put another one of these things up that we'll never read, they're actually fundamental. They are the stratigraphic charts summarizing the information available from all those basins. And so they're vital to know about them. Um, and there is one extra unconformity in here, this mid Cretaceous unconformity through this patch that goes through all the basins. I point that out straight away now because it comes up again and again in this talk. This is another similar sort of chart, but this time we're looking here at the rocks in the Auriferous, in a Auriferous into the Graben, into the Central Graben, into the Viking Graben, compared to west of Shetland and the Northern North Sea. And on here, we've got the what we call the top seals. This is what the, uh, the, the oil and gas companies have always looked at, the top seals for the various rocks. So these, these are acting as top seals for the, for the rocks. And then we've got over here, the division of the Cretaceous, not into lower and upper Cretaceous, that's still there, but notice we've got K1 mega sequence and K2 mega sequence. And I'm following Stoker et al 2016 in doing this. And they, I, I think they've done a wonderful job. It's a lovely paper and, 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 the, and the offshore memoirs. And they recognize that there's this big unconformity, which they picked up certainly in the, in the Faroe Shetland Basin, but also in, in, in other basins, that that unconformity is a better way of dividing up the Cretaceous and then helping us link the Cretaceous to the onshore in the Hebrides. So we'll come back to that again at a later stage. And I'll leave you to read these diagrams yourself when you, when you can, when your eyesight's improved. Now, this is a fundamental diagram. This is, these are transects across the Faroe Shetland Basin from Stoker. I'm, I'm sure he must have given you a talk on this from his work before he went off to Australia, probably not, no. Um, but it, it's a lovely piece of work and it's all part of the Pharaohs and BGS pulling together a lot of information. You can see the various unconformities identified in these cross sections. So here we have the Faroe Islands and here are the Shetland Islands and this is the Faroe Shetland Basin. We have various fault control ridges like the Rona High and the Corona High and the Mid-Faroe High. And the Corona High is, is in the Rona High is in here. Um, and there are lots of individual basins which have their own history in relation to sedimentation during the Cretaceous. But the broad picture is that there are unconformities that we can trace across them all. So here's the base tertiary unconformity, which is pretty straightforward to pick up. Here it's more difficult where the lava plateaus, where the lava flows are. But here, you can see there's this mid Cretaceous unconformity, which is not the boundary between the lower and upper Cretaceous. It's the boundary within the, the <coughs> late Chironian, Coniacian, Santonian, which you remember now completely from what I said to you earlier. Um, and then below that, you've got the K1 mega se sequence, which is the, broadly the lower Cretaceous bit, if you like. But notice how the faulting goes through the Cretaceous rocks as well as anything else. And the fault blocks are having a huge impact on the distribution of sediments, their thicknesses and the types of sediments present. And that's a wonderful model that we've been able to apply to a lot of the offshore basins. And each of these transects, this is transect B here, and this is transect C here, you can see the same thing. And we see the same thing elsewhere. And I think if you were reading your publicity for this talk, you will have studied this diagram in depth. Um, I know you will have enjoyed looking at the publicity for this talk. Uh, Roger especially, I know, was uh, challenging me on it last night in the pub. Um, but here we have this mid Cretaceous unconformity, the MCU, and you see where it is, late Chironian, Coniacian, Santonian. And this summary diagram illustrates the way in which the sediments are built up in the basins. And you can see the change of rate of sedimentation taking place as we go up, as sea levels also rise. Here's a sea level chart broadly. And as sea levels are rising, but you've also got these unconformities creating and developing the basins into which the sediments are building up. You've also got regional tectonics to consider. Uh, we've got a whole range of different phases of tectonism, 
late Cimmerian is well known at, 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 between the late Jurassic and the early Cretaceous. And then the Austrian phase, which is usually considered to be Aptian Albion as part of the Alpine tectonics. And then the sub hercinian phase, which many of you may not be terribly familiar with. The sub hercinian tectonics is based on the basins in Germany to the north of the Hartz Mountains. In the Hartz block, you've got a whole series of Cretaceous basins that the Germans call the sub hercinian basins. And in 1928, that's where Stiller and many others identified tectonics affecting Cretaceous rocks, not just along the faults and fault margins, but also across all the salt domes as well. So very similar to the North Sea. Uh, so this is a very important period of tectonism because it relates to our big unconformity, which we're recognizing everywhere. That's dividing the Cretaceous. So remember, this is, this is new stuff. It's not published anywhere else, presented like this anywhere else. Uh, so you, you might find it quite difficult to get into in the first place. But when you then look in the Murray Firth, and here we're looking at two transects across the Murray Firth, you see section one here, section two here, outline of Scotland. So you're into the outer Murray Firth here with the Halibut Horst out here. And when you look at these sections, and this again comes from, it comes from uh, offshore memoirs by BGS. So this is a direct take from them, but modified to, to, to illustrate the unconformities a bit more clearly, you'll see the same, what they call in this publication, intra-Synonian, and I told you in, Synonian is a term we no longer use. We want to be much more specific about the stage names and the age of these unconformities. So this is a, a, a Santonian unconformity, um, and this is an old, early Chironian unconformity here, and so on, and the late Campanian one. And these are the same ages broadly, of, of the unconformities that we've seen in the Faroe Shetland Basin, but here they are in the Outer Murray Firth. So we're seeing the same tectonic sedimentary events in, in, in the basins either side of Scotland. And it's not just there. There's some wonderful work done by uh, another group of authors, Hampton et al., with all the micro, nano, micro and nano paleontology, looking at this old fish structure in the central garden. And the, okay, it's partly salt driven, but it's also fault driven. Um, and some of the salt that's pile, uh, that uh, the salt diapers and things are actually driven by faults anyway. So, and they are located frequently over faults that have moved and started to drive the salt. And it's not surprising then that the unconformities that we see here and, and the structures that we see are of the same broad age as the structures we see in the Outer Murray Firth and in areas where we have no salt. And then I was so delighted when we were pulling our chapter together to see this diagram, because it's from a group of authors who I've always disagreed with, um, who thought everything in the Cretaceous was sea level driven, but actually, and, and no tectonics. And uh, they now entirely agree that it's both sea level and tectonics driving things. And they recognize this early Campanian unconformity in, in, the, in the Danish Norwegian sector. Wow, I couldn't believe it when I saw this diagram. Alongside Stoker's diagram, these two diagrams have really changed and, and reinforced my view of what's happening in the Cretaceous and made it much easier to write the chapter. Um, so it's been wonderful picking up these papers and summarizing them and reviewing them. Uh, Stuart, you had probably had the same experience when you were writing your chapter. Those, those days, yeah, I just to... Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> See whether you agree with it all. Um, and what is interesting is this: these groups of authors have agreed that basin inversion and the intensification of bottom currents are interlinked. So if you're changing your architecture of your basins via tectonic movements, you're changing your currents in your basins. And so you're getting the intensification of both happening at the same time as you go up the Cretaceous succession. So as you get higher in the Cretaceous into the Campanian here, you're starting to see more and more of these potential currents and, and also turbidites, chalk turbidites, just like South Georgia, you know, Roger, um, and slump beds. As you can see the the you, notation that's on these things, these are slump beds and, 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 and channels and things forming at times when you're also getting tectonic movements. 
and changing the architecture of your basins. So there's a lot going on in the upper Cretaceous that we know only too little about. And there's an enormous amount more work to do on all of this. We're just summarizing it very simply, as simply as we can. So having told you this story about the offshore basins, where does the Inner Hebrides succession fit into this picture? And that's the interesting bit. And I'm going to just draw your attention to some of the early work that was done on the Cretaceous in the Inner Hebrides, going back as far as Hutton and Judd, and Judd in particular, obviously, doing the Mesozoic rocks of Scotland. It's a wonderful uh, piece of work. Um, but he also found fossils in the chalks on in Ben Eden and other places that nobody else seems to refer to, which I can't understand because they're, they're vital to our story. Um, and so the early workers actually had the strat almost right. They all recognized this upper Cretaceous had two parts. Cenomanian, you know what Cenomanian, what we mean by Cenomanian now, the bottom end of the upper Cretaceous there, and Cenonian. They use the word Cenonian, but we now know what we mean by Cenonian. It's those other stages above that. So when you're looking at that old literature and you see these terms, you'll know exactly what they mean now. And the, the great joy of it is that they seem to get it right because subsequent to that, some research was done by people like Sharon Braley and others uh, on the uh, Inner Hebrides Cretaceous. And they came to the view that the deposits were all Cenomanian Charonian. And that is what we see in some of the offshore memoirs for places like Rum and other places. So when you're reading those memoirs, be careful. They talk about the Cretaceous being Cenomanian and Chironian, and yet all the early workers had it much younger. And I think they were right. Um, I'm just going to try and prove that to you, see whether you agree by the end of this talk. There's another very interesting piece of work being done relatively recently again by BGS, mapping between Ardnamurchan and Rum, they identified this fault. Uh, I don't know whether Kevin Smith is here tonight or maybe listening. Is Kevin Smith just still with you in BGS? Uh, anyway, it's his paper and his work identified this fault, for example, here, and how it linked into the Kamasunari fault. And I hope by the end of this talk, I'll show you that these two faults have controlled the distribution of the Cretaceous rocks in the Inner Hebrides. So they must have been active even then. And, and Kevin and the BGS colleagues were using this to show that the Ardnamurchan and, and Rum volcanic centers were linked by the fault. So their work is very interesting in that respect. And if, if these faults were also moving before that in the Cretaceous, it's interesting. I'm gonna take you to Mull first to show you the, the, the key sections. And on Mull, we've got this section here called Gribbon. I, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Gribbon and looked at the sections, but it's, a, it's, it's the type section for the Scottish chalk. Hooray, you've got a type section for the Scottish chalk. And you've also got some lovely sections here in Carsaig and along the, the, this coast of, of Mull as well. And then you've got the sections around Loch Arlen uh, on Morven and up here on Ben Eden in Morven as well. And I'm gonna run through some of these sections to show you what's going on. Uh, we'll start with the Gribbon, the type section. You see it gets all sorts of geologists excited when they go out to look at this stuff. And I know you haven't gone out there and been terribly excited by it yet, but you will be when you go and look at it. Um, there's not much of it. It's all buried under gorse. And uh, I gather that the gorse has grown even more now. So you'd have to really dig your way to get underneath there to have a look at any of this. And it's a tiny little section only a few meters thick, and yet it tells an incredible story. Now, when you're talking about Scottish geology, with sometimes with thousands of meters of sections and all your other things, you think, oh God, tiny, tiny little section, only a few meters thick. But that few meters, when you link it out to the bigger, wider picture of your offshore basins, you can start to see how they all fit together. And there are deposits there that have never been properly described. There's the chalk above, and this is these are the beds below, and these are silty, silty little glauconitic green sands. They are vital to any story on transgression or regression. Doesn't matter which part of the rock column you are in the Mesozoic. 
you're getting glauconitic silts and things coming in with your transgressions. And these are present in the rocks here on Mull, but never properly described before. And they also have, if you can, you can you see the coloration on this, these little clusts here, they're slightly brown. That slightly brown color is phosphate. They're phosphatized. So we've got a phosphatic event within your seas, the Cretaceous seas at this time. And how does this link elsewhere uh, across our region? And just to show you that section, that field section starts down here with um, what appear to be Cenomanian deposits um, uh, with particular types of shells in, and then we go into these pale sandstones, and then here is the boundary, and then the chalks come in, and then there's something else. But look how thick the section is for the whole of this Cretaceous bit in that exposure. Now, isn't that great for Scottish geology? Nine meters? Isn't that what you expect to see when you're going out in the field to measure up your sections? Makes it easier if you've only got nine meters to put in your log book and a graph paper, mind you, uh, and sample it. Um, and then there are other, other boulders, very poor exposures. This one, a block in a stream. The only way to get in there to do it is to dive into the stream. And I have an expert in the, in, 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 in the, in the audience who loves diving into streams to measure sections, Roger. Glacier streams in particular. Uh, but in this case, we did. We had to dive into the stream and measure this section and get the details out of it. And when you get the details out of it, you've got this very complex sort of structure to, the, to, to that block and going up into green sands above and fine grain red shelly material at the top. I'll just point out this one. Can you read that where you are at the back? Does it, is it possible to read that? Can you see fawn colored saccharoidal textured material? That fawn colored layer, I'm going to talk a bit about that in a minute. But when you take slabs of this stuff, cut and polish it and look at it, it's got this wonderful gray burrow mottled texture in amongst the chalks. That's very like a, an ordinary chalk that's not been solidified, but it's got the same sort of burrow mottled texture. And when you look at this with thin sections, this is all in plain polarized light, looking at bits of this, you can see sponge spicules, you can see echinoids, and you can see foraminifera, and here the foraminifera at the top, as you go up into the red beds above, these foraminifera, they're all planktic foraminifera, and they are the, the, the chambers are full of glauconite. And there's a huge story to tell there, uh, which has not been told, and this requires an enormous amount more research to fully understand it all, but it's all there, and it, will, and it would be worth studying in much more detail. And even in these blocks, we can pick out what are typical what you would have put in the past called upper chalk fossils. These are little sponges and so on. So this material is definitely not Cenomanian and it's very unlikely to be Chironian. It's got things that are much younger than that in it. And then it's also got this, remember I mentioned that fawn colored layer? The fawn colored layer has diatoms. It's the only layer that I found these diatoms in it. And these diatoms, I'm not a specialist in diatoms. And so I was working with Danny we were running a, 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 a workshop in Aberdeen for four oil companies. And I think it was Chevron. So I said, I showed them these pictures. And I said, I have no idea what these are. And they said, there's no problem. We'll send them back to our people across the States and Canada. And that was Thursday evening, Friday morning. They came back and said, no, these look just like the Campanian um, diatoms that we have in North Canada. And I thought, well, wow, 24 hours to get a decent answer. Um, that's the way to do geology. Um, however, I haven't put them in the book. Why haven't I put them in the book? Because I don't have the confidence to put them in the book. I, okay, they've been identified as that age, but I don't know whether they're freshwater, whether they're seawater diatoms and so on. So one of you, two of you here might be real specialists on diatoms. Anyone like to put their hand up? No, um, but it, I throw it out there. Um, these help, they're, they're a companion in age, whatever you call them. Uh, according to the uh, people from the United States and Canada. So if they're Campanian in age, that makes these chalks much, much younger than, than Cenomanian. Um, and it matches with the macro fossils and the other fossils that we've got from here, which were collected by all the old boys, the old survey. And they were right. So what fossils have we got from the Gribben chalk, putting it all together? We've got shell fragments, which relate to typical upper chalk ones. We've got sponges, sponge spicules. 
we've got echinoids and echinoid spines. You can see the age of this particular uh, echinoid is uh, Santonian to Campanian. We've got microfossils that the early people thought were definitely Santonian. And these are published in the Cretaceous Strat version of the, uh, the, of the Jolsoc little memoirs they produce for every single, uh, every, every single period of the, of the geolog geological column. And for the Cretaceous, this one, Rawson et al, 1978, they were right. I'm pretty sure they're right. Whoever had collected all these and analyzed them and looked at them. We've now got these diatoms, uh, which are probably Campanian as well. So we're, we're, looking at, we're looking at material which is much younger than the standard published material for all this uh, geology. And beneath the Gribbon chalk, we have all sorts of other things that we'll return to in a minute. We've got oysters of different types, some of which are Chironian, some of which are Cenomanian. And we've got something which is called a seven-sided hepterus, a seven-sided serpulid, uh, which is absolutely classic part of the assemblage of bed four of the Plenus Miles right across Europe. And we found it at Carsaig in the sandstones. And we, so we know that that's the boundary between the Cenomanian and Chironian, uh, yeah, Cenomanian and Chironian boundary interval, which makes all the Lock Island sands, which were put into the Chiron, uh, into partly into Cenomanian, makes them all Chironian at the very least. And there are lots of other sections around, and this is the great joy of doing Scottish geology. There's never a continuous section to work with. You've just got boulders, and in these boulders, can you see these rather beautiful big oysters? These, you just go along and walk down the slope and you'll find them in enormous abundance. And they are typically at the base of, of the Chironian here and in Northern Ireland. And then you've got these stream sections. There are always stream sections. This one wasn't too flooded, but it's got the Otnatangi stream section in Gribbon. It's the biggest and longest and best section we've got. And you'll see here's the measured section for it. And as you come up from the Cenomanian Morven green sands at the base, we come up into the Lock Island white sandstones, which are probably Tyronean into the Coniacian. And right at the top, you're coming into the chalks. And then you come into the post chalk uh, sediments, um, which are probably Paleogene, Paleocene, and uh, a mixture of lavas, tough material, and all sorts of other things. However, there are also big blocks which have been translated from somewhere into this sediment. And those big blocks, would you believe? This is the mid-Cretaceous unconformity. Very interesting. There it is sitting in a stream section on, on Mull. And then as always, we've got some wonderful stream sections um, and you have to climb up the waterfalls to actually measure these beds. But when you do, you can start to see the same sorts of layers that we've just been looking at in Altmatangi and Gribbon. So this is at Carsaig and you've got these uh, more than green sands and interbedded shales, and they pass up into the pale white sandstones of the Lock Island sandstone formation. It's starting to make a lot of sense. There's, there's a continuity between the various sections. They look similar. When you, when you have got the time to, to walk through all these sections in a week, you'll, you'll see the pattern straight away. So I'm going to take you somewhere else uh, on more than... Um, uh, Lock Island mines and Ben Eden in particular. And it's on Ben Eden that the Belemnites have been found by people like Judd, 1878. And I'm just surprised that no one has used that information properly. I know those Belemnites have gone, and some of you might be able to help here. The, the original collections made by all these early geologists, they were either with BGS or in places like the Hunterian Museum. And myself and Chris Wood, who's a BGS Cretaceous geologist for many, many years, we tried to track these down and we couldn't find them. So we couldn't prove that they were Bellamnatellas, but they are Bellamnites, part of the Bellamnite chalks. They have to be young chalks. And you know, we'll show you in a minute the others that we've got. Mm -hmm. And this section on Men Eden, we had to dig it out in pouring rain, which is always the most appalling way to do these things. But when we did dig that section out and measure it accurately, we came up with a section like this, which again is not very thick. It's only a matter of meters thick, but it had five uh, sponge beds and phosphate beds in it. And those phosphatic green sands, very similar. Do you remember I showed you the phosphatic pebble bed at Gribbon? 
very similar. And many years ago, it's cited in Rawson et al. and it's cited elsewhere that the uh, the sponges from these beds were by Reed and others from Northern Ireland, from Queens Belfast, were exactly the same sponges species as he had in the clogfin sponge beds at the beginning of the Northern Irish chalks. Here we've got these phosphatic chalks, uh, uh, phosphatic green sands uh, beneath whatever bits of chalk we've got left, and they're very thin, and the same at Gribbon. So we're seeing the same sort of succession, whether you're here on Ben Eden or elsewhere, and you've got an awful lot more material. I've, I've co fortunately collected a lot of material despite the weather and the rain, and the uh, and we were staying in the little hotel in Loch Arlen. And when we got back late at night, the 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 hotel hotelier saw us coming, and he walked straight towards us with two glasses of whiskey, and he said, "You guys need this," and uh, he was absolutely right. We'd, we'd only just made it back because it was a complete whiteout getting back off the mountain. And the only way we got back was by following the boundary between the metamorph following the boundary between the metamorphic rocks and, and the Mesozoic rocks. Um, anyway, these, these deposits are brilliant. They have all sorts of things in them that you can actually use to, to date them. And there's a lot more work got to be done on these. And hopefully someone will try and do that. And then there are the Loch Island mines. I mean, some of you will have visited these mines. There are about 70 miles of underground tunnels here into the Loch Island white sands and used for glass, very high grade glass ma manufacture. You, you probably all know about these, yes, or not? No, so, some of you do and some of you don't. Well, at the beginning of the Second World War, when Belgium was overrun, we lost our, our access to high grade uh, sands for making glasses for things like submarine periscopes. We had to find another resource. And this turned up to be the best. And so this was started during the Second World War and continued subsequently. Um, and they're wonderful glass sands. They've got very special properties which I'm not going to try and go into now, but they've always been used for high-grade optics. And they have exactly the same Rincostrian oysters in these sands that I've showed you before in the Balmenic boulders. They're the same thing. And at Carseg, you can follow them all the way through. But this section, you'll notice, doesn't go up into any chalks and things at the top. It stops abruptly. So this, this unconformity is even bigger at the top of this section here in Loch Island than it is on Ben Eden. And when we put all the section, well, not all the section, but just some of these sections together on between Mull and Morven, you'll notice that they're all clastic, primarily sand sections, clastic sections of various sorts, very little limestone or chalk. But it was up on Ben Eden, um, and people like Judd used to camp up there and knew all the shielings and knew the shepherds very well, and the shepherds used to dig out the lignites from the Paleocene to burn as fuel, and they also walked the outcrops and knew where all the lignites were and found them. And I just find the lack of using that evidence in some of the literature rather sad because those guys knew what they were doing and did a wonderful job in collecting things. So I, I'll emphasize clastic dominated sections. We're now going to the island of Egg, and there are three sections on Egg. And guess what? They're, they're all in waterfalls of some sort. So this one is typically up here. It was a very interesting section, but we decided it was too much to try and actually measure that one that particular day and I've never managed to go back to I was on egg on the day they got the day after they just got independence bought themselves and as, as someone said to me were they still sober um uh they probably weren't but we've got well looked after uh and then there are other two sections here Clack Alistair which gives its name to the Clack Alistair conglomerate one of the key units in the Cretaceous and there's a much more important section here at Lake Gorge, which sadly I think is now gone because they've made it into a little hydro scheme. And so the actual field section is underwater now. Back Alistair, we've always wondered what age it was because it's been used in the literature as a boundary, key boundary. And I'm not convinced that it's the same age everywhere and it's the same thing everywhere. But well, just we've still got it as a name in the literature. Um, and the section at Clack is, this is in, you can see that's two meters there. So this is in millimeters. So you're talking about a really big section. Um, 
in millimeters and trying to work your way through it. It's got an amazing deposit at the base here, which we'll have a look at in a minute. It's got this conglomerate here, and then it goes up into other things, which I am very uncertain about in terms of age, but interestingly, you've got a sort of green sand structure at the top, sands with uh, uh, these amygdaloidal lava boulders in it. I don't know whether anybody's looked at those and tried to date them and decide, are they the earliest lavas on in the, in, 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 in the succession? That base of the section here has phosphatic pebbles and it's unconformable on the Jurassic. So there's a big gap between the Jurassic and the, uh, and the early Cretaceous. And this material is incredible. This is, this is phosphatic material. And when I came to look at it, I couldn't quite believe what I was looking at. You know what those are? Any ideas what those might be? They're things that Roger loves. They're called filamentous algae. Um, and they're typical, they're phosph phosphatic, they're typical of phosphate deposits. And this is in fact Alistair, obviously, but the similar structures have been described from the phosphatic de deposits of the Campanian Maastrichtian on the Negev Desert in southern Israel. And there's, there's huge amounts in North Africa and across the Middle East. There's a huge succession of phosphates of the same age. So it's very interesting. I, I'd never seen anything like this before until I looked at this under the electron microscope. Um, how many of you have seen things, structures like this before? No, so there's a lot of interest in this geology and then have these tiny sections, apparently totally insignificant, but they've got fabulous stuff in them. Um, and the same structures, incidentally, are, are, are at Corrie Reback. So there you go, cycles of colonization by filamentous microphytes. That means a lot to you, I know. I can see you smiling and thinking about that. Well, I, 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 you knew you were going to get something different from the Cretaceous this time, weren't you? Did you know the Cretaceous of Scotland had these exciting things in it? And then this is the most complete section on egg, Malay Gorge. And this is the one that I think has been filled up now, where they've got a little hydro scheme on, on egg. And so they put a dam in, and so the water's backed up right up through this thing. But it's an incredibly valuable section. And when you look at it, um, if you look at a normal chalk, you can see all these beautiful coccoliths in it. Can you see the rings of what we call coccoliths? And they've got these long bits, which we call rhabdoliths. Uh, it's actually packed. That's a normal chalk from southern England. Now look at the Lake Gorge limestone. It's got the same things in it, exactly the same. So it must have once been chalk, although it's called a limestone, it was a chalk. And uh, not only that, it has the same species in it. Uh, they're very difficult to identify in SEM compared to the normal methods of actually studying nano nanofossils. But nevertheless, there are species there that look suspiciously like Campanian species of the Macronatosome and not like the Cenomanian and Chironian species, that all of this stuff's dated Cenomanian and Chironian in, in the literature. I'm very surprised at that because you only needed to look at this with an electron microscope and you can see what's there. So now we turn to the last few sections of the Inner Hebrides, this time on Sky. And there are some lovely sections, one of which I'm not gonna to talk to you about because it's so fantastic. I haven't been able to research it properly yet, but that's staying secret until I've got it sorted. Um, until someone grabs me in the bar to find out where it is. So here at Strolimus, we're going to look at some limestones. Here at Strathaird, we're going to look at some limestones. I'm not going to look at the Kamasunri ones, although those are limestones again. And you can pick the limestones out straight away as you always do when you're mapping, because look at the change in color in the vegetation. You can see straight away that these are the limestones. And you get up here and there's these dark gray blue limestones and they're lovely. When you measure the section, you see you've got a section which has flint bands in it, and these boulders with flints in it. You've got sponge beds, you've got shell beds. And people like Richie in the, in the, in the early days of the geological survey all thought these were, were originally chalks. But I've looked at these with an electron microscope quite extensively, and I can't see a single coccolith. And I can see ghosts of what might have been coccoliths, but I, could, I wouldn't put my money on saying that they really are. They're too heavily recrystallized. So a lot of the material up here has been so heavily recrystallized. The important thing is though, it's a limestone section. And you'll see why this is important in a minute and putting together the paleogeography of the Inner Hebrides geology. 
And then you've got this mighty big section about a meter, a meter thick here in Strathaird. Um, it's a, but when you, you think, oh God, that's got nothing in it. But when you actually start to look at it, it's got a dark gray limestone here, the Strathaird limestone. It's got these, this uh, nodular Block Island white sandstone below, and then probably what the Morven green sand as well, a little bit. But you see the thickness of the section. Most of this is Jurassic here. And then you've got this contact surface, and then you come up through these chalks into these limestones. And lo and behold, the limestones are full of these things, calcispheres. And again, I don't know whether you've ever heard of calcispheres or seen them, but they're a very important component of Cretaceous, particularly upper Cretaceous rocks, particularly abundant in the late Turonian Coniacian. Um, but we have no really good dates, definitive dates for any of these limestones. And they may well have been chalks in the past. However, Sharon Braley and her PhD thesis did identify foraminifera in sin section. And I'm told by the micro paleontologists that identifying speed down to species level for, for micro fossils is exceedingly difficult and dangerous thing to do. Um, uh, so the, and I've put this little image, SEM image of what that particular species of forum might be like, and that's uh, Sharon's interpretation of these of these uh, microfossils in this rock. And if she's right, then this would be lower and middle Turonian in age, this limestone, which means we've got a limestone of an earlier uh, age than the one at Lake Gorge. So there's maybe several ages of limestones that we've got in amongst the Inner Hebrides succession. I don't think we should be fooled into thinking they're all necessarily the same age. And then there's the Isle of Arran. And as you probably well know, you have limestone and sandstone blocks in the central volcanic complex. And these have sunk a kilometer or so into the caldera and the caldera collapse. Um, this is one of them known as the Pigeon Cave full of guano that the local people used to go up to get. Uh, so it's excavated out. It's also known as the Lost Piper's Cave. They say they can hear the piper piping out to sea. It must have been a good whiskey. Um, and, but lo and behold, one, a, a great friend of mine from the Geologist Association on a field trip in 1977 said he found this belemnite at this, at, um, at, at, um, uh, uh, at La Beg Point on Arran. And I've tried to go and re-look at this to find, to see whether I can find that block of chalk. Uh, and it was hard to listen if I told, I'm, but I wasn't able to refind and relocate it some years later. However, if he's right, then these are belemnites from some of the chalk deposits on Arran. And they match with the records that uh, the Gel Survey have from other areas, more than and other areas with occasionally finding the odd belemnite, which and these belemnite chalks are Campanian in age. So much younger than anything that we've talked about before. Uh, I haven't put this in the book, Stuart, because I don't know, I can't tie down the, the exact locality. I can't put it in context at all in geological context. So I don't know uh, whether we, we could use it or should use it, but I'm putting it here to show you that the sorts of things people have found and may well be extremely relevant to trying to date the Cretaceous deposits within the Inner Hebrides. And they look like the things that have been recorded by the old geological survey. So what do we definitely have? Now, I've told you that Sharon and others doing the micropaleontology say using thin sections to work on, on to, to, to identify species is very difficult. Hence the macro fossils become really critical because they are the things we can identify. And we've got some very good ones. When this one was found by Mick Oates, who worked for British Gas, but his PhD was on the Jurassic of Scotland. And this is, he's, this is what he found in Loch Arlen in the Loch Arlen Sands in the Cretaceous. And he's got a wonderful, I don't know whether you've ever go to some of these collections that these people have in their houses. He's got barns full of, full of fossils. Um, and he lives on the south side of the Humber in a beautiful place, Barrow on Humber. If you ever get a chance to go and look at it. But he's got fossils galore from the Loch Island sands and other things that nobody's ever recorded. And I went to have a look at all these things and they're amazing. They're molds, which clearly show 
that the Lock Island sands must be Turonian and that the Morven Green sands are clearly Cenomanian. So we've got a totally different age for these things to some of the other. And this is a shark's tooth out of the phosphatic chalks on Ben Eden. I've got tons of this material in bags um, that I hope one day we'll be able to do extra work on because it's got an awful lot of stuff in it that has yet to be identified. It shows you there's a lot still to be done on the Scottish in a upper Cretaceous. So the Inner Hebrides has a succession of upper Cretaceous rocks, includes phosphates and green sands, dated from Cenomania to Turonian sandstones, to Turonian, Santonian, Campanian, and or Maastrichtian limestones. And above that, we've got a succession which is extremely poorly dated, which could be late Cretaceous or early Pelagene. We just don't know. There's an awful lot of more work to be done. And, and, and this, is, this is all the material under the lavas, under the first lava, under the Staffer lava flow. Possibly all the Inner Hebrides and adjacent mainland was covered by a chalk sea. This is suggested by finding chalk, actually in situ chalk, in pretty well every section, even if it's only very thin. And that's what some of the early geologists uh, gave the, that's the evidence the early geologists used to say that Scotland was probably covered by the chalk sea at one stage. Some of the limestones were clearly once chalks. They're now recrystallized or modified into limestones. Can we place this succession in a wider context with Northern Ireland? I'm just going to show you the succession in Northern Ireland. Well, first of all, I'm going to show you this is the published information that's available for the Inner Hebrides Cretaceous succession. And you see the Lock Island sandstones here, the Morven formation here, Cenomanian. Lay Gorge sandstone member and Strathaird limestone, Chironian. And then these other units up here are probably after the late Cretaceous. However, and, and it's in, in a way it's a bit sad. If you look at that, I think we've already shown you the Lock Island sandstone member cannot be Cenomanian. There's too much in it. We've found the Hepteris, the seven-sided uh, circulate, which is the Plenus Miles within Plenus Miles bed four, right across Europe. No problem at all with that. So the base of the Lock Island sandstone member must be basal Turonian. Um, we've looked at the Strathaird limestone and the various sections that are shown for the Strathaird limestone include the Lake Gorge, include Strathaird and include Strolimus. They're probably not the same age. They're probably different age limestones, and they're much younger. And we've got other limestones, which we now know have belemnites in them, and the chalks have belemnites in them, which are much, much younger still. So this model, published model for the Inner Hebrides Cretaceous is completely wrong, apart from having Cenomanian down here. And we've seen, I've shown you the fossils from the Gribbon Chalk. We know that in, 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 they're at the very earliest late Coniacian and Santanian in age into the Campanian. So we've tried to update the successions for the Inner Hebrides. And I think the old accounts for the macrofossils, including the Belemnites, the Echinoids, the sponges, and then lower down the Rincostrian oysters, the Amphidontian oysters, and Hepterus and so on, are, it's just too strong, too much strong evidence showing that the ages of those rocks. And in Northern Ireland, there are some really wonderful similarities. First of all, you've got the Belfast Miles and the Island McGee sandst siltstones and sandstones. This matches extremely well. The Hibernian greensand matches very well with the Morven greensand. We then come up through sandstones, some of which will match probably with the Lock Island sandstone member. They've got the same Rincostrian oysters in them. And then we come up to the beginning of the chalk, and lo and behold, we've got the clog fin sponge beds here, with this, which if you remember right at the beginning, I said Reed uh, from Queens Belfast identified all of this and did the work on the Cretaceous in Northern Ireland, and he recognized exactly the same species of sponges, the same age at, in, um, uh, in Morven on the Cody Reback section. So we've got a link with the chalks, um, which is very important. Just put that in, the clog fin sponge beds. And then the chalk deposition is not a continuous section of chalk. It's got lots of hiatuses in it, just as we've seen already in the North Sea and elsewhere, uh, and in the Faroe Shetland Basin. And on Mull, you've got, um, you've got big hiatuses within this section. 
and the youngest chalks deposited on the high are, up to, are deposited on the highest areas of Northern Ireland, and they seem to be also here. And we've got them in Morven, the youngest chalks, when the sea levels were at their highest at their maximum. Remember on that sea level curve, and I said 72 million years ago, you saw that within the Campanian, there's another one in the Maastrichtian. Those were the highest sea levels, and that's when we find our belemnite chalks on the highest ground in both Northern Ireland and in the Hebrides. So we can now place this succession um, in a wider context. We've got this big hiatus here with the Glauconitic sand, the Gribbon chalk and the Glauconit. This is about um, early camp, possibly early Campanian unconformity matching the offshore basins. We've got these sponge beds and things in the late Santonian um, and this could match up easily with the mid Cretaceous unconformity that we've already, we showed you earlier on in the Faroe Shetland Basin and in the Outer Murray Firth and in the Central Graven. We've got the Plenus Miles Bed 4 circulated matches up with the Loch Island White Sandstones, which actually matches up here with the sandstones in Northern Ireland. So we've got a lot of keys linking the Northern Ireland succession with the Inner Hebrides succession. And then we've got the limestones. And the limestones, the youngest of these, probably chalks, were belemnite chalks originally. And we have the same in Northern Ireland as we do here. But the gaps are much bigger in the Inner Hebrides. So the unconformities are much more significant, much bigger. So the gaps, so we're only getting tiny little thin sections of what we get compared to Northern Ireland and what we get compared to offshore, of course, we've got much more complete sections. And we've got our mid Cretaceous unconformity stuck right in the middle of this, making one of the big unconformities that we see on the seismic sections, but we now can probably relate to the big gaps that we get in the Inner Hebrides and in Northern Ireland. So just to, to Upper Cretaceous lithofascies, remember I, at the beginning when I showed you the map of the Inner Hebrides, we showed you these faults. This one here, the Fascadale Fault, and this one here, the Kamasunari Fault. If you remember from what we've just been talking about, the limestone sections were here at Strolimus, Strathard, and to some extent here at Lake Gorge on, on Egg. And what's interesting is these limestone sections fall within the boundaries of these two faults. When we come down here onto Mull and Morven, remember I said these are mostly clastic sections. So it may be that these faults are actually dividing off the Cretaceous within the Inner Hebrides, creating a, a limestone region and limestone basin over here and a much more clastic sections over here. And these faults were probably active during the late Cretaceous. When you look at all the faults that were active in all the offshore basins, it would be very surprising if some of these weren't active onshore as well. So that's giving, that I haven't put in the chapter. We haven't put in the chapter, have we, Danny? Because that, I felt, I felt that was too speculative. But it, now I look at it on, on a big screen like this, it looks very positive. And having talked to you and had enough whiskey this morning, uh, I think I'm much more positive about that being right. And when we look at the Upper Cretaceous sea level curve based on Hancock and so on, we can see the Morven green sands, Cenomanian, are down here. As the sea level rises, it's got okay, it's got fluctuations in there. We've got breaks within each part of the chalks, uh, each part of the succession, the Cretaceous succession. But we've got a very big break here the, uh, at, at this at this juncture, which is with a regression, and that matches up with the mid Cretaceous unconformity here in the. Lake Chironian, Coniacean, early Santonian. So we're seeing even in this sea level curve, the evidence possibly for that unconformity. And we have on Ben Eden and Clack Alistair, the phosphates, which are Santonian. We've got the Gribbon chalk, which is probably Santonian, early Campanian. And then up the top, if you look at the way the sea levels are rising right through, we've got these uh, melamnite chalks high up in both Northern Ireland and, and the Inner Hebrides. Uh, to me, that makes much more sense than the succession that's, that's published uh, for this area. So in summary, base Cretaceous, we only actually see offshore in the offshore sections. We have no onshore sections showing the base Cretaceous. So that unconformity has to be looked at in offshore basins. 
Regional Aptian, Aptian Albion rifting and rising global sea levels were, went, went on through the Cretaceous. This pushed shorelines onto highs within basins. And I, I've cited, I've cited your, your, your chapter there, Stuart, yes, because it's such an important chapter with your paleogeographic maps. At the beginning of the Upper Cretaceous, we sediment, see sedimentary evidence for the marine transgressions preserved in the west of Scotland and offshore basins. Um, post sedimentian we see phases of tectonically driven subsidence involving intermittent phases of normal faulting, folding, strike slip, now recognized in most of those basins. And in the North Sea and Faroe Shetland offshore basins, the Cretaceous rocks onlap the edges of basins and shed material from fault controlled highs. So you're getting a lot of material being, being generated from the fault control blocks. And we've got possible fault movements. I didn't mention much on the Great Glen, but that's that's in the possibly in the chapter. I can't remember. We put that in the chapter, and then the Fascadale and Camasunary faults as well. The real key to unlocking the Cretaceous of Scotland has been recognizing the mid Cretaceous, late Coniacian and Santonian to early Campanian unconformity succession. That because it's there, it's present in all the basins, and it's present on shore. I don't think I'm going to go through all that detail. I just want to show you when we completed that interpretation and after we'd submitted our chapter, because it's two years ago now that we submitted the chapter and it was approved. It seems a long time ago and things have happened since then. And then I, uh, I got this beautiful publication, uh, data released by the Irish government on their offshore basins. And lo and behold, in their offshore basins, they also recognised this Santonian early Campanian break in all the offshore basins and going up into the rock oil basin as well and i thought wow we weren't danny we weren't wrong to actually push that in our chapter it looks like it really does work as a key break and so it was lovely to see this supporting evidence from a completely different group of authors who we'd not communicated with at all but they've actually produced something which is very similar and so it is really recognizing this K1, K2 mega sequence boundary, which has improved our understanding, of the timing and correlation of Cretaceous events across the British Isles, and provided a link to tectonics in Europe as well, with the subhercinian tectonism in the subhercinian basins of Germany and elsewhere. And the on, this is a good example of possible, which is probably the onshore example of the K1-K2 boundary on the Isle of Mull, these phosphatic chalks and green sands, because you get a complete change in sedimentation above and below of this unconformity. So, our chapter adds a few supports to the bridge <laughs> towards understanding Cretaceous events and linking onshore upper Cretaceous. We've identified some new lithologies like the green sands and phosphate phosphatic horizons. We recognize huge lateral changes and probably think we might have some reasons for it, the role of faults, inversion, and so on, very important. The trouble is each inner Hebrides uh, location has several exposures, each with its own unique upper Cretaceous Paleocene uh, geology. Um, and it, it looked impossible when we first started on it, but now we've put this key element into it, the unconformity successions, I think we've got a key to, to actually tying it all together. And I think for the first time, the Inner Hebrides succession is no longer an isolated, curious piece of geology, but actually part of a regional pattern related to Atlantic rifting, inversion, marine transgression, and continental European tectonics. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>